In this video, we're going to talk about what is natural selection. In that topic, we'll talk about variations, adaptations, and how they eventually lead to evolution of a species. So typically, something that I always get wrong is that natural selection and evolution are the same thing. Uh, evolution is just when animals are slowly changing over time. How that process happens is by natural selection. All right, so how evolution works by natural selection is there's a few different steps that is needed in order for this process to actually happen. Uh, they're listed out here. So the fact that all animals struggle to survive, uh, their variation and adaptations, something called survival of the fittest, and we'll talk about what natural selection is momentarily. So the first things first, and this is something that probably you know coming into the class, is that there's always a, a struggle for survival. Uh, in any kind of population, there are always more individuals born than can survive. And what that does is that leads to competition. That competition can be between animals of the same species, something called intraspecific competition. Uh, you typically see these animals fighting for food, they can fight for territory, any type of resource, even fighting for particular mates on who to mate with and produce offspring. That all provides competition. That's very important when it comes to natural selection. In any kind of population, uh, there are always differences in a population. We call those differences variations. Some things that cause variation is mutations, right? So genetic changes in DNA, and something called gene flow, which we'll talk about later. Animals have some really cool adaptations. Uh, if you take a look at color changes, always, or camouflage is always an easy example. Uh, this is actually a picture of a moth that has evolved eye-like spots. So to deter predators because it looks like an owl, you wouldn't want to attack something that could eat you in return. Uh, and even plants, plants have adaptations, special formed leaves, uh, cacti have needles, which are just modified leaves. And what that leads us to is something called survival of the fittest, that individuals with adaptations best suited for their environment, they're the ones that can survive and reproduce. Think about a population of rabbits. Uh, there's always going to be variation in the population. Sometimes those variations can come from mutations. If you look at this population of rabbits, I have brown rabbits and I have white rabbits. Now, sometimes those variations provide an advantage over the others in their environment. If I go ahead and add wolves, what we can see is our wolves are going to go ahead and eat the white rabbits first uh, because they're the easiest to spot. Now, yes, of course, the wolves will eat the brown rabbits if they are available, but in this situation, the environment has the brown fur color being the adaptation. If the environment were to switch, if something were to happen uh, or change, that's gonna have an impact on the organism. So if I take a look at my rabbit population now, and I keep all their conditions the same, uh, my wolves, when they come around the next time, you can see that now having brown fur is not the adaptation, having white fur is. So what students usually get wrong is they say, oh, students adapt to their environment. That's not true. You're already born with the adaptation that you actually have, and it's the environment that determines whether the traits you have will benefit you in terms of survival. Individuals with characteristics that are not fit for their environment, obviously, if you're not fitted for your environment, you're going to leave less offspring. And that, come, that leads us to a term called biological fitness. Biological fitness is... Um, essentially how many offspring you can leave to the next generations, how well you can survive and reproduce. An animal that has more offspring would be considered more biologically fit than an animal that does not leave many offspring or none at all. It is not the strongest survive because that does not matter. It's whoever leaves the most offspring. And all these three things lead to natural selection happening. Natural selection is pretty easy to understand. Uh, essentially, you see that nature selects. Nature selects those organisms with variations better suited for their environment, and they're going to leave more offspring. And what that means is that beneficial traits become more common in a population. Uh, if you take a look at this image here, really easy to uh, see, that we talked about already that already there are more individuals born in a population that can survive. Some of those individuals have differences. Some have horns, some are lighter color, some are lighter or darker color, and this works in many other examples, not just color. Color is just an easy talking point. Uh, and then some animals are naturally better suited to their environment. So those animals that are not suited well will die off, leaving those animals who are, circled by my mouse there, they will survive and reproduce and pass their traits onto the next generation. The key thing here with natural selection is we are not going from one 
organism into another. It's not a banana tree turning into a, uh, a mango tree. That's not how it works here. Natural selection is a small change in traits that will add up over time. Let's go ahead and talk about one example of natural selection that we can actually see occurring in nature is uh, the example of the bullworm and cotton. Uh, the bullworm is a pest that eats and damages cotton crops and has shown that natural selection can act even faster than scientists can genetically engineer something. Some cotton crops have been genetically modified to produce a toxin that's harmful for most bullworm. A small number of bullworms had a mutation that gave them immunity to the toxin. They ate the cotton and lived while all non-immune bullworms died. The intense population pressure has produced broad immunity to the toxin in the entire species within the span of just a few years. Just so you guys are aware of, this is what we're working with here. Here's the actual worm. All right, so this is an example of natural selection because within our worm population, there was variation because there's variation in every population. Uh, this worm was, or a worm, had the natural variation of being immune to a particular toxin produced by the plant. So what ended up happening is we saw that over time, all the non-immune worms that took a bite of the plant, they were exposed to the toxin, they died off. They were unable to digest it. But by random chance, some bullworms were naturally immune. And if they were immune, they were able to eat the cotton, survive and reproduce just fine. So we're able to see an increase in this population of worms. Uh, and now most of the worms are actually affected by the toxin. Another good example of natural selection is when we're working with bacterial resistance. Uh, to antibiotics. The first antibiotic penicillin was produced in the 1940s as some kind of drug that would help fight bacteria. Uh, it was very effective against fighting the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus, which is known as staph. Um, some of you guys may have heard of a staph infection. In 1941, it was able to wipe out almost every strain of the staph bacteria. However, current day, 70 to 80 years later, almost 95% of all staph strains found in the environment are actually resistant to this antibiotic, and that, that's a big deal. So kind of similar to the bullworm, is we saw that these bacteria, when we started handing out all these antibiotics, were killed off, and that was really beneficial for us humans. However, some of these staph bacteria naturally were immune to this particular antibiotic, and if we're killing off all the strains that are not immune, we're only leaving the immune ones to reproduce. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing a lot of these um, these bacteria, something called superbugs, um, becoming very common in the world. And, and it's very uh, concerning because if we run out of antibiotic, which is estimated to happen about the year 2030 or 2050, uh, we will actually have millions of people dying from infections that you used to go to the doctor and say, hey, give me an antibiotic, give me a quick pill, and I'll be done. That's natural selection happening on that population. The beneficial trait of becoming calm or resistant to the penicillin became more common throughout time.